telephone booth are those gradual things that change so they make sure everything's equally blurry no matter where I look. <laughs> <laughs> you know? They, they ever make those things work? No. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and call the September 5th meeting of the Historic Preservation Commission to, uh, uh, to order. Uh, <laughs> can we have the roll, please? Chairman Lane. Here. Commissioner Sibley. Here. Commissioner Fenster. Here. Commissioner Derrick. Here. Commissioner Norton. Here. Commissioner Jacoby. Here. Commissioner Barnett. Here. Council Member Mayor Peck. Here. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, first item on the agenda is approval of the August 1st minutes. Uh, I understand we may have a correction. Commissioner Barnard. Yes, it, on the page five, lines 31 through 34, I sent in a recommendation to uh, Maria. She accepted those, but she, it wasn't time to put them in these copies. And it was during the uh, comments of the commissioners. And on page, hmm, actually page three, page five of the minutes, and it's lines 28 through 34. Um, and what I, what I changed, it, what I suggested being changed is that the, the conference I was referring, the camp I was referring to is in Steamboat Springs, mm -hmm. not in La Junta. Oh. And that uh, that was the only change. Are microphones on? Oh. Yep. Is that enough? Yeah. Uh, not in, now you're not, but now you okay. are. Okay. There you go. Can you hear, can everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's on page three of the actual minutes of the meetings, lines twenty-eight through thirty-four. Uh, is it's written about what I said about uh, going to the on the road conferences. And the point I had made that that we heard a we heard a presentation. Well, we we heard that presentation during the Boulder um, conference, and it was about steam the camp in Steamboat Springs. So I just clarified that, and yeah. You know, okay. As opposed to what it says. so I'd move the clarifications. Okay. Any other c comments from any other commissioners? If not, I'd entertain a motion. Chairman, I think you need a motion. I move yeah. to approve the minutes with changes as discussed. Thank you. Moved by Commissioner Jacoby. Do I have a second? I'll second. So seconded by Commissioner Norton. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. The minutes are approved as amended. Okay, uh, next uh, report from the chair. Uh, I have two items. Um, the first is just, uh, I did, there was a, was an article published in the Long, oh, I'm sorry, in the Boulder Weekly uh, about the Tower of Compassion. And so um, I did forward that uh, to the commissioners and uh, appreciate everyone's effort on that. Was, I thought it was a pretty well, well done article. Um, so, um, I have not heard anything more from um, the um, Tinker Mill. They were talking about doing something on that as well. Uh, and then, uh, I guess just as a <coughs> point of note, if it interests those of you on the commission, I was asked by um, the state of Colorado's um, state review board to serve on that, um, uh, basically, starting in January. So that would be the board that does review uh, state and federal nominate, nominations to the register. So um, I intend to accept that. Uh, I think that'll be pretty interesting and be happy to keep you all updated as to what happens. So if there's anybody in this room that uh, <laughs> referred me, uh, I suppose I should thank you. <laughs> I don't know why you're looking out. <laughs> Uh, and that's all I have. Um, communications from our HBC liaison. 
Good evening, Chairman Lane and members of the board. I have a few updates. Hopefully, everyone, let me get a little closer to me so folks can hear. Um, so just in terms of some staff updates, um, we have not re reviewed any um, administrative certificates of appropriateness since the August meeting. Um, you know, we had kind of a We've had kind of a run on on roof re roofs um, in the last year or so, given all the hailstorms we've had. So, um, so we have not had any administrative certificates of appropriateness. I did have an application for tax credits, a potential tax credit um, from a residential side, hand delivered today. So that will probably be something coming to the board or coming to the commission. I um, literally received it this afternoon at about four o'clock. So <laughs> I can't really tell you anything about it. Um, the Tower of Compassion, the public hearing for landmark designation is going to be at the city council meeting on Tuesday, September 10th. Um, so it will be under the second reading public hearing items um, and should hopefully be a nice, uh, happy feel good break for the council from all of the budget items. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, so that once we have that landmarking done, then we will be um, looking at the process for getting that move forward for listing on the state and ultimately national register. So you may either have to recuse yourself or be a ringer. <laughs> <laughs> Whichever one the Bible state. Um, so relating, so our meeting start, so in terms of meeting t start times, um, we've been advised that chambers are again available for our normal 5 p.m. meeting start time. Um, if we do decide to keep it at 6, we would need to um, amend the bylaws to reflect that. Kind of relating to that, um, we have some... <laughs> logistic challenges for our October meeting. Um, that October 3rd date is smack in the middle of the Colorado Planning Association Conference, um, which will be in Loveland this year. Um, so we can make the meeting happen if we need to meet, um, if we have agenda items. Um, but I would suggest that if we do that, if we do have the October meeting that we keep it at six just so I can get here <laughs> from Loveland on, in time. Um, so that is just a challenge I wanted to, to pose. Um, I would also need to speak with Josh from Ayers to see if he would be able to do that as well. Um, I believe he is in a leadership position with the Colorado chapter of the American Planning Association, so I don't know if he would be able to get away from the conference, but um, TBD on that one. Um, <laughs> So that's something, um, I don't know if you want to pause and discuss it or just kind of let me get through my items and discuss that once I'm done. I'm making notes. Keep rolling. Okay, yep. cool. <laughs> so um, relating to the article in the Boulder Weekly, just as an FYI heads up, if folks do get um, press inquiries, we have a new public information officer, Rogelio Mares, and he has requested that um, any press inquiries be directed to him before responding to, to them. They're just trying to keep a tighter, not new leash, but <laughs> have, make sure every, everything is, is vetted well and, and everyone's fully aware. So nonetheless, I think it was a great article um, in, in the Boulder Weekly. There was, it was really focused on the Kanemoto family. So I don't, there was nothing, there was nothing in there that would, that would run afoul of, of public information. He just wanted as a FYI, hey, run it through me first. Um, let's see. Finally, we do have, and this is something that will probably be coming to the commission in some form or fashion, and may very well to be, an, I have still working with the, the project planner to um, determine um, coordination with the applicant, et cetera. We do have an application under consideration for the Beaupre Farms site, um, annexation of, I know some of the property has been annexed, um, but some of it has not. So it's it's kind of a combination annexation amendment to the existing annexation concept plan amendment. There's a few different applications rolled into it, but the county did comment on the fact that there are um, historic farm buildings on that property that um, would be eligible for county landmarking status. So if they're annexed into the city, um, so we we. That's something we probably want to coordinate with the county. So I, I am in communication with Kristen Cody, who is the project manager for that project from our side. Um, and we'll be having discussions um, 
with the applicant on that as well. See see what we can what we can do with relation to those farm buildings. I do know that there had been, there were modifications to that sewer line project that were done to to um, enable those buildings to at least somewhat be preserved. So. Um, so that's a discussion we need to have as well. So stay tuned on that. Um, they did just do the first round of, of review. We just got the, the comments from the county last week. So actually, let me take that back. I think we just did a pre-application on that. So regardless, early stages of the application process, I'm in communication with our um, with our development review section, and um, you know everyone's pretty pretty well. Um, <laughs> you know, briefed on if something that could impact historic properties comes up to loop me in, you know, early and often. Um, related to that, um, just from a procedural standpoint, um, I'll just give you the update that our building permit folks have been extremely good about, you know, let, looping me in and contacting me if there's any even question of whether a property might need historic review. So um, those checks have definitely been put in place. And, um, you know, so even if it's interior projects, they're, they're, they're asking me if we need to, if I need to look at it. So, um, so yeah, we have uh, definitely put in some, put in some, some guardrails um, and, and ensuring that we have um, frequent communication. Great. Thank you. Uh, any questions for staff from commissioners? No. Um, just to address the start time and uh, October meeting, I, I would say I'm a little hesitant to call off the, mm -hmm. or try to postpone the October meeting based on the last time we tried to move a meeting around. Um, <laughs> uh, for a number of reasons. Um, so I don't have any problem with uh, keeping the October meeting at six o'clock. Does any anyone else on the commission have an issue with that? No. Do we need a formal motion for that, or do we? Is, is that can just? I think to be safe, we would do a formal motion, and then also then then take up the the question of of permanent meeting right, time right after that. Yeah. Okay. So with regard to the October meeting, uh, can I get a motion? Motioner Jacoby. I move that the next uh, commission meeting be held at 6 p.m. also. I'll second. All right. Moved uh, by Commissioner Jacoby and seconded by Commissioner Norton. All those in favor? Say aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? None. All right. There we go. Um, so our October meeting would be at 6. Separate item moving forward after that. Is there any feeling as to whether 6 or 5 is a preferred time? Um, from the commissioners. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. I mean, I've I've always been in favor of the five o'clock meeting. Um, uh, but you, it's from staff's perspective, is that put any kind of burden on you or? I have no preference either way. Um, just so long as it's not at seven. <laughs> 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 we have a few of those meetings at seven, so. And and it would just effectively default to five mm -hmm. if we do nothing. Correct. Okay. That's in the bylaws state that we meet on the first Thursday at five o'clock unless otherwise. Okay. So if somebody feels passionate enough about it, you can make a motion. Otherwise, I'm going to move on. And you only make a motion to change it to six. Okay. Hearing nothing. Well, those meetings will maintain their position at five o'clock, starting in November. Okay. Uh, next, we have public invited to be heard for anything that is not on the agenda. We didn't have anybody sign up for that, so I'm assuming that everyone who is here is for the public hearing. So I'll go ahead and close the um, open public invited to be heard and move on to our public hearing on 844 Baker Street. So if we could get the staff report. All right, thank you, members of the commission. So um, we have a request for demolition at 844 Baker Street. This is um, basically the first application of the revised demolition code, um, demolition ordinance that was adopted earlier this year. Um, I will note that typically the ordinance kicks in 
when there has been a formal application for um, a demolition permit. Uh, in the present case, the property owner had a pre-application meeting with development services, uh, with development review committee staff regarding a proposal to subdivide this property. Um, so do a minor subdivision for the purpose of, of constructing two single family homes. Um, I recommended that before they get too far down the pipe with the subdivision, that they should really come and talk to the commission first um, about the demolition since it, it would trigger the demolition ordinance. So, so at this point, we do not yet have a formal application for demolition, but we are doing the review as if we did. Um, essentially, like I said, trying to have some efficiencies, but also be proactive, on, being proactive on the part of the applicant as well. So this particular property is at the um, northeast, I'm sorry, southeast, I apparently don't know my directions anymore, um, southeast corner of um, 8th and ba of 9th and Baker um, in the historic east side neighborhood. As I mentioned, um, this demolition is being requested to facilitate subdivision um, for the construction of two single family homes. I will note there has been, there's a supplemental, um, supplement to the original report that was uh, both emailed to members of the commission as well as handed out in hard copy form, uh, documentation from the applicant regarding um, some estimates and statements from an engineer, et cetera, um, you know, appraisal information from the appraisal as far as, um, you know, conditions on, on the site, et cetera. Um, so that information has been provided. It was received after the, after the packet was, was posted and sent out. So, um, so as noted, this is being reviewed subject to section 2.51, uh, 2.56180 of um, the Longmont Municipal Code. Um, this property is much like most of the historic Eastside neighborhood zoned residential single family, which does have a um, minimum lot size of 5,000 square feet. In the present case, the um, this property is 11,500 square feet, so it's, it's quite a large parcel, um, both relative to the zoning district, but also relative to just the general area as well. So this is a, it's a fairly small home. It was uh, built in 1904. It is a 753 square foot vernacular hip roof um, wood frame building. Um, it hasn't really changed much from its original construction per the cultural resources survey that was done in 2002. At some point there was uh, vinyl siding put on, um, but aside from that, there really haven't been very many exterior alterations. Um, I'm going from two different computers, so we'll see if I can make this work. Um, so at some point there was a garage and a hen house and those were demolished at some point in the property's history. Um, so like I said, as I mentioned, there, the applicant, the property owner did have a pre-application meeting um, back in June with the Development Review Committee to discuss the proposed subdivision of the property, um, at which we recommended that he proceed with the demolition review ahead of doing the subdivision just to ensure that he could do what he wanted to do. So as, no, as I noted, the cultural resources survey did note that there's generally a pretty high le level of ac architectural integrity. That survey is a little bit dated at this point, but it's still based on a search of, of building permit records. It does not appear that there really have been any changes since then, aside from some minor interior um, interior jobs. Um, the owner has indicated to staff that there are a lot of condition issues with the house that, that make uh, preservation and reuse both costly but also impractical. Um, most notably, there are uh, apparently foundation issues that are, are fairly sub significant. Um, the other challenge is also the site, the pro the house is located pretty smack in the middle of the site, so um, it w really isn't, if, if it's not as feasible to keep this property and subdivide and have two legally conforming lots in the residential single family zoning district. So there is that, there is that challenge as well. Um, so there is photo documentation in the staff report that um, details the existing conditions of the property. Um, 
showing both exterior and interior conditions on the property. Um, so Commissioner Lane, Commission Chair Lane and I did um, review, do an initial review of this um, proposal um, earlier this summer and um, determined that it would be advisable to bring it to the full commission for, for review and consideration. Um, so the question based on our, based on uh, section 25680 um, is whether or not there's reasonable cause to believe that this property may be eligible for designation as a landmark without the owner's consent. Um, so as the ordinance is set up, if the property meets the criteria for designation with you know, so basically we do the review and take a look at well does this look like it's eligible for listing without the owner's consent and that is a much higher bar and so the question is that's the question for the commission is is this something that would meet that requirement or meet that threshold and which would then preclude um, demolition at this time because that would then refer the 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 project through that landmark designation process. So just going through briefly the criteria. So there are five criteria for designation without the owner's consent. Um, technically six, the first one would be um, petition, a petition requirement. But in the case of the, in the case of proposed demolitions, that petition requirement is, is not, um, not a, an effect basically. So is, would it meet one or more of the designation criteria in subsection A? Does the property have what is um, referred to as extraordinary historic significance? Uh, does the condition prevent the owner from reasonably preserving the structure? Um, would designation create a hardship for the property owner? And does promotion of public interest as defined in the Historic Preservation Ordinance um, outweigh any resulting diminution of market value. So going through this, um, in terms of the designation criteria in subsection A of the eight criteria, staff is of the opinion that four are probably met. So, um, okay, this is what happens when I try to do two mice at the same time. <laughs> with me here. So the four that staff is of the opinion would be met are um, whether the property has character interest or value as part of the development or um, of Longmont, basically the cultural, artistic, social, ethnic, economic mm -hmm. heritage of the city. Um, this is part of the original town plat and it is an example of the frame vernacular building style that was popular in the early 20th century and is present throughout the historic east side neighborhood. Um, the site does not contain, is not the location of a significant historic event, so that criteria is not, not applicable, nor is it identified with a person who significantly contributed to the development mm -hmm. of the city, county, or state, um, or country. Um, in terms of whether the property portrays a historic era characterized by a distinctive architectural style, as I noted, it is an example of that frame vernacular building style that was popular in the early 20th century um, and is present throughout uh, this particular part of Longmont. It is not identified with a master builder or architect um, whose work was an influence in, this, in the development of the city or county. Um, in terms of elements of architectural design details, craftsmanship representing a significant architectural innovation, not necessarily per se, a, a specific innovation per se, aside from, again, being that frame vernacular, um, you know, with the fish scale um, siding up on, on the upper levels of, of the structure. Um, and then the other question is the geographic or regional importance. And this gets to the heart of our um, demolition ordinance. And that is that the property is located within the original town plat. And if the historic Eastside National Register District boundaries included this portion of the neighborhood, it would be considered a contributing structure. Um, the cultural resource survey that's included with a packet 
indicated that it's really the significance of this property is as a piece of the neighborhood. Um, but it is the challenge is that it's not technically part of a designated district, whether that's a uh, local state or national register. So then when we get down to the criteria for designation without the owner's consent, uh, you to these slides? I Can't hear you. do apologize. I, I again, um, well, actually, uh, n not yet. <laughs> I, I, I was talking through the report more than anything. So the first one really is going, getting through the criteria with the owner's consent. So I, I, I really try not to have a ton of words on slides. So <laughs> um, that's a personal style thing, but I do apologize for that. So when we get to the criteria for the landmarking without the owner's consent. Um, the question is, again, one, does it meet at least one of the designation criteria that I just went, went through? Next, does the property have what's considered extraordinary historic significance? Um, staff is not of the opinion, based on the, the documentation that's been, that, that we have on file, um, it doesn't seem like it would rise necessarily rise to that level. Um, you know, what is considered extraordinary historic significance is definitely subjective and does not have a clear definition in the code, but it is generally accepted as, you know, was there an important event there? Was there, um, you know, did someone significant live there? Um, or, you know, something of that sort. Um, from what we can tell, um, it's been, it, it doesn't, doesn't have that, um, I guess, status of there being, you know, one of the town founders or, um, you know, a significant visitor, um, you know, or some sort of event on the site per se. But again, this is staff's, <laughs> staff's opinion. This is a determination for the commission to make ultimately. So the next question is, does the condition of the property prevent the owner from reasonably preserving the structure related to that? Um, would the designation create a hardship for the owner? So supplemental documentation presented to the commission and to staff does indicate that the cost of needed repairs could approach the, the value and purchase price of the property. Um, so that is that is a discussion for the commission and for the property owner to have, frankly. Um, at this point, the property, the structure really isn't habitable. Um, it ha there, there are significant electrical as well as plumbing conditions. Um, and again, the foundation, the, the foundation issues described um, definitely present some challenges. The information presented from the appraisal and as well as an engineer's um, you know assessment of the foundation indicate there are some significant problems there um, you know we have uh, the applicant has also indicated that it just it really isn't economically feasible um, to, pr to preserve the home um, and there's also the the practical difficulty of um, you know, it's a 750 square foot home, which for modern living purposes does present some challenges as well. So um, I don't have a direct recommendation on whether or not it's extraordinarily, um, you know, presents a hardship or um, is not economically feasible. I do believe that's a discussion for the staff, for the applicant and the commission to have, especially considering the uh, late presented information as well. So finally, the a final um, criteria is going to be whether the promotion of the public interests relating to historic preservation identified in the Longmont Municipal Code um, by designating the property a landmark would outweigh any resulting diminution of the market value of the proposed landmark. Um, and this is really, you know, I will apologize for being a little, you know, 
both sides in my report, but this really is a bigger policy question. This is a question that the commission needs to have. It's driven a lot of um, discussion at council on various projects as well. Um, over the in the last few years, um, you know there is the there is the concern that historic neighborhoods are lost one building at a time and losing one building, you ultimately do it's like you get a tooth knocked out and then all of a sudden you need dentures. Um, the original town plat does re represent the original square mile town of Longmont that was incorporated in 1873. And this property is part of this early history. Um, it's also located at one of the entrances of the, to the original town, which probably accounts for the larger size of this parcel, since it was kind of the edge of town going out into probably the more agricultural parts of the area. Um, at the same time, the subject property is not part of a designated historic district, either at the local or national register level. Um, it would be considered a contributing structure if it were part of such a district. Um, the question is whether or not it rises to that higher threshold um, required for designation of, of a property without the owner's consent. Um, you know, weighing this out, we also have the issue of the need for housing in, in Longmont. Um, we don't have a lot of available land as, 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 as a planner. This is also one of our big, you know, challenges here is we don't have available land. Um, and increasing density within established neighborhoods is a strategy identified within Envision Longmont um, for increasing the city's housing supply. Um, so while not a huge impact, this property could accommodate, uh, you know, two, two single family housing units and be in compliance with the land development code. Um, unfortunately, this existing house is, like, as I mentioned, it's situated in the center of the lot. Let me go back just so you can see a little bit here. So this is the parcel here. And the house is kind of smack, and to be fair, the county assessor footprints aren't always perfectly located where they should, where they, they are on the lot. But it's situated in a way that it would be very difficult to subdivide the property and build a second home and keep this house um, while still meeting all of the land, all of our land development code standards. There are options for doing, you know, variances and, and modifications and such. Um, but that's something that would need to be, you know, we would need to see just survey surveying in terms of, you know, exact, exactly how much space we're working with it, if that, if that were a consideration. So again, ultimately the question for the commission um, and potentially city council is whether the need, our need for additional housing um, outweighs the public benefits of preserving the house at 844 Baker Street. Um, and so that's really the question for council for the commission this evening. Um, this particular public hearing was noticed um, as in accordance with the historic preservation ordinance. So it did this, the property was posted with signs and there was um, published notice in the Times call as well. So the options presented then before council would be to approve demolition of this property, don't approve it, and refer it to the process for designation as a landmark without the owner's consent, which ultimately would require um, approval by city council, or to defer a action based on the need for additional information. So my initial recommendation was that we defer action based on the need for additional information. We have received a lot of this additional information, so the question is whether the information provided is sufficient to meet the commission's needs. Um, with that, um, I have nothing else to add, and I'm here for questions, and the applicant and property owner, Scott Golden, is also, also here for, for questions. Okay, great. Uh, do any commissioners have questions for staff to start off with? Commissioner Jacoby. Uh, with regards to deferral, um, I'm not sure with the new code how it's written. Does that mean it would be reconsidered, other options would be considered, and then brought back to us, or would that be the limits of our input would it be coming back to us after the deferral if it were deferred based on yeah 
Okay, again, let me try using one mouse at a time. Um, it would basically would be deferring to a later meeting for, for review of additional information. So, Okay, uh, if there are no other questions for staff, uh, would the applicant like to offer any comments or? Yeah, if you'd come up to the mic and just state your name, address. Thank you. Um, my wife and I acquired. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, for the record. My name is Scott Golden, um, and I actually live in um, Johnstown at the moment, 23583 Conrad Street. Um, my wife and I acquired this property um, from a relative who um, was in, put into a long care facility. Um, and we purchased the property in order to provide him with sufficient funds to pay his medical bills and to have something to live on. Um, so we, in essence, over, overpaid for it, um, $200,000, but um, knowing that the condition was not, um, in my opinion, livable. Um, it's one bedroom, one bath. Um, the plumbing issues are, um, none of the, the, okay. The house has not been maintained for the past 20 years while he lived there. Um, he was not able to care for the property. Um, in addition, the foundation of the property is, um, stacked stone, uh, red, um, red rock stone and it is collapsing um, all around it. Um, my initial attempt to figure out what the cost of repair would be um, had been rebuffed by a couple of different uh, foundation companies who just basically said, not worth it. Um, so we won't even bid on it. Um, got an engineer to look at it and give me an idea of what it would take to actually repair the foundation. And um, then I also have some experience with electrical and plumbing issues uh, as I am uh, property management for my family and um, noted that both are substandard and that there would be extensive work in order to make the house livable at this point therefore it's not really rentable um and it's not um it's not saleable uh to anyone that i'm aware of um who wouldn't want to go in and and put in a lot of money to repair it and then it would be beyond the value of the uh, of the area um the appraisal actually states that it's not um viable to do that it's on page 12. My only option to get out of this was to subdivide and provide um, two houses for people in, in the city. Um, and so that's what my goal is. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions for the applicant? Um, I have just one quick one. If if there was a way to keep the home and get two lots, would that be something that you would entertain? I would if I, if it's uh, economically viable. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Jacoby. Do you have a question for the applicant? Yes, uh, I have a question for you. Oh, if I come back, okay. thank you. Sorry, I, I thought we were done. <laughs> yeah, I'll let you go. Um, yeah, uh, where to begin? Uh, so I, I saw in your application that you have two uh, modular homes you want to put on this site. Correct. Um, do you know? So those are modular, pre-planned homes. How much does one of those homes run roughly in comparison to the repairs for this? Um, it would each home would run the price I got was one hundred and seventy four thousand 
Um, it's probably a little bit more now okay. than it was. But that's about the price of, of one home. Okay. And I, I read through this, and forgive me, I'm, I'm, I get a little woozy when I, by the time I get to page 11 or of anything. I understand. Um, the cost you thought would be about 194 and change, is that right, for Correct. correcting this thing? Did you look at potentially moving the house slightly on the lot? You, you talked about repairing the foundation. When I read this, my, my immediate thought was, how about building a full basement next door so you can increase the square footage, move the house over onto the new foundation, do the repairs, and that may be comparable in cost to building one of your new modular homes. And that would also preserve the architectural integrity and the character of the home rather than these modular homes which would not fit into the neighborhood and would again uh, be an anathema to the historic nature of the neighborhood did you think about moving i mean powell moving i know that, has moved moved something for me in the neighborhood and and they've moved other facilities have you looked into that i have not i just recently thought about that um as a possibility but the biggest challenge i have is i I am not sure that the structure of the the building itself would survive such a move. Um, I can my my a moving expert mate would my, have a better idea. Yeah, right? my structural engineer, the engineer that I had come out did not look at that as a as as the uh, possibility. But um, so okay, yeah. All right, thank you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Norton. Um, yes, and actually this is question for staff. If we do a force designation, it would be locally designated, would the property owner then be eligible for residential tax credits for work done on this property? That is actually a very good question. You typically, if a property is designated, then it is eligible for tax credits. Um, I don't know that the mechanism for designation has any impact on that eligibility. I don't think so either. Okay. I just want to put that out there for consideration as we are brainstorming different directions. Okay. And that brings up another point that I would like to make before we move on, which is I am quite sure that I can get financing for the new project. I am not sure that I would be able to get the financing unless I had additional help from the city in order to move the house because that would I would have to um, go to people who would loan me the money and I'm not sure if that that's available to me. Okay. Commissioner Jacoby, do you have another comment? Yeah, I, again, I'm not sure if you explored, if you're familiar with the benefits of historic designation of your home. I was looking at the expenses you listed, and that included $8,000 for permits. Well, permits in the city can be waived, and materials uh, taxes can be waived. Um, window replacement was eight and a half thousand. We, we, we've talked here before about other much cheaper alternatives if the windows are structurally sound. And I, I, who knows? That would have to be looked at. There was, you know, a thousand for fencing and landscaping, which would be going on anyway if you put in other things. So really, the numbers might come down and it, it might be economically feasible to move it, which would be so much nicer for the neighborhood. And being history dweebs, we, I'm sure we would all love to see that that uh, home preserved. You know, it's vernacular style, but it is very characteristic for the time. Um, it fits quite exquisitely into the neighborhood. And I, for one, would consider it for historic designation if you wanted to pursue that first, and that may save you significantly in some of your expenses, and that's something I think you should look into before we decide to scrape and restart. The only uh, comment I could make to that, uh, Commissioner, is that um, 
I would definitely have to look into it. I understand that. I understand that um, from the appraisal that I was reading um, when I was preparing for tonight. Um, the appraisal indicated that the siding on the house is actually rotting at this point, which would make it even more uh, difficult to accomplish what you're asking for, but uh, or what you're suggesting. But um, I'm not opposed to to looking at that as a possibility. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? No. Thank you very much for coming down. Uh, I'll now uh, open up the uh, public hearing, and the first uh, person on our list is Sarah Levinson. If you would please come up and uh, state your name and address before your comments, and you'll have uh, three minutes to speak. Good after good evening, commissioners and Mayor Pack. My name is Sarah Levison. I live in the historic Booth House, which is the second home that the quarterback of that 1908 championship high school football team lived in, um, built in 1907. We also had foundation issues, which, you know, the house is still standing and a um, couple of cracks in the wall, but we didn't have the foundation sitting on two corners of the house. And the engineer said, it was so solidly built, and houses were in that day and age, that there it was um, no problem with the structural part of the house, even though the foundation. So I think the foundation issue is a, a minor thing, even though it seems major. I would like to um, start my comments with reminding the commission about what's on the city's website. Um, what's historic preservation? Its uh, intention is to preserve, conserve, and protect buildings, objects, landscapes, or other artifacts of historical si significance. Why is it important? Benefits to the community, including uh, contributing to the Longmont's sense of place, helps to convey the past to the future and tells Longmont's story. Um, benefits to the environment. Again, with demolition, um, it is um, more sustainable to recycle the built environment and therefore reduce what we put in the landfill and it also conserves resources. Benefits for the economy, preservation of historic properties can help to stimulate the local economy creating jobs and enhancing tourism. Uh, Colorado Preservation Inc. has a study that includes the additional economic benefits. So I'll point out that the manufactured homes that would be placed on this would be manufactured somewhere else and the economic benefit would be somewhere else in some other city. So I think that that's another consideration about demolition, um, the economic be benefit. Um, I um, also think that there is a, a false narrative that's been created that your choice is to demolish it and get two brand spanking new homes that if you look at the uh, proposal have nothing to do with the character of the neighborhood. It is, um, as uh, staff pointed out, the uh, entrance to the neighborhood and to have that um, as the entrance to the neighborhood would start diminishing the value and the historic properties um, adjacent. Um, in the landmark book, um, Taming the Terror Down by James Lindbergh that was published by the National Trust for Historic Places, this is the um, exact criteria um, and the beginning of a teardown trend. And so, the um, small properties next door then become the next target. And um, I'm thinking, um, first of all, I would also like that the commission does not consider the supplemental <coughs> information because it was not available to the public at all, not even on a hard copy. I had to borrow staff's copy when we walked in. And um, there was no time for the public to participate in that conversation. Um, the uh, demolition of a home, the argument that it's inconvenient because of the location, it's too small. We're promoting small houses. 762 square feet is only 300, less than 300 square feet um, than what the 1,000 square foot replacements are. So I ask you to um, not allow the demolition on the property. I also ask you not to consider the additional information um, that was um, submitted at a very late hour, and also to allow the members of the public to rebut um, uh, other 
comments by the uh, applicant at a, a later time. Thank you. Next speaker, uh, Scott and Marsha Golden. Oh, that's you. Oh, you're on the list. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, just I'm just b b blind, blindly leading this. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, Sharon O'Leary. Sharon O'Leary, 534 Emory Street. Historic neighborhoods are lost one home at a time. Let me say that again. Historic neighborhoods are lost one home at a time. The city of Longmont thought that preservation was so important that in 1971, they formed the Preservation Historic Preservation Commission to preserve and conserve for the citizens of Longmont and future generations. You were selected from a pool of people who applied to sit on this commission. This is not a book club. This is not a social club, but a commission that is is expected to be thoughtful in making hard decisions surrounding preservation. I hope you're up for the job. 844 Baker sits in Longmont's oldest neighborhood, the Historic East Side neighborhood, which a section of it has national designation as well as local designation throughout the neighborhood. This home may have some problems given its age, and there's not a home in the neighborhood that does not have structural foundation problems. Is this going to be the bedrock for demolishing future homes? These problems can be remedied and possibly with the designation could receive assistance through the preservation program. Longmont cannot save, Longmont cannot be in the business of saving only grand homes, but also our humble beginnings. Demolition should be the last option on the table. Preservation benefits the community. It, it benefits the environment, as what Sarah said earlier, and preservation benefits the economy. You need to make the decision that honors the role you were given and request a postponement, postponement to look at other options. Um, staff said that that home is unlivable, then why did not the city condemn it. Staff talked about the home being unlivable due to the size. Well, what are you comparing it to? A tiny house or a grand mansion? Has anyone thought about adding an ADU to this address? If you want to address housing problems, that's another option. But allowing demolition by neglect as your new yardstick, then you are not in the preservation business. I ask you, historic neighborhoods can also be saved one home at a, the time. I ask that you do your preservation job. You need more information. The public did not have access to all the information you have. You need to do the right thing and keep the public in the process. I do appreciate your time on being on this commission, but step up, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Our next uh, speaker was Dido Clark, but she's not available. Do you have that letter? I uh, do. Okay. If you'll give me one moment. I will. I will read if I can get this thing to the full page view. All right, that is as clear as mud, but I will I will read I will read this into the record. Okay. Um, to whom it may concern, I was dismayed to see the sign for a proposed demolition permit for 844 Baker Street for a beautiful historic home just down the road from me. I can see no good reason for demolishing this property. It is a unique, irreplaceable house with a unique history. For well over a century, this house has been part of our historic neighborhood, which contains a National Historic District. While it may or may not be contributing in a strict sense, um, parenthetical, I can no longer tell because I can no longer find the surveys on the City of Longmont website. That's a completely different story as an aside. Um, we are trying to work on that. Uh, this house certainly contributes to our lived experience as historic Eastside neighbors. 
The new owner's application for demolition shows a complete lack of any sensibility or understanding of the neighborhood that we are so proud of, as well as total lack of creative thinking. I don't want to feel like I live in a time capsule, but nor do I want to see our neighborhood literally disappear one house at a time. So could these new owners developers consider moving the existing building onto new foundations if it indeed actually needs new foundations? The cost of moving could be offset by purchasing a complete house ADU kit that involve, includes full kitchens, bathrooms, lighting, floors, etc. These can bought, be bought online for relatively little. There are dozens of companies to choose from for these ready, already built homes, many of which would fit perfectly in size and style into our neighborhood. Thank you, Dr. Dido Clark, a co-chair of the Historic Eastside Neighborhood Association, 534 Baker Street, Longmont, Colorado, 80501. Okay, thank you for reading that into the record. Uh, the last speaker I have is Brian Clark. I live at uh, 825 Baker Street, across the street. I've been there for 43 years, and that's kind of part of the neighborhood, you know. I like the idea of, of keeping the house, moving it. That's really a, really a good idea. I mean, keeping it, maybe add to it, put a basement under it. But the problem with putting two houses on that lot, there's been right at that intersection in front across from Grandpa's Pond, there's been cars hit there at least five or six times that I know of because there's parking there for Grandpa's Pond on, and they all park on that side of the street and you bring more cars, there's no place to park as it is on that street. And I don't want people drifting down the street, parking, taking up all my parking spots. And my next door neighbor, he's got these logs in front of the property where you can't, if you park there, you can't open your car door on the passenger side. So um, I like the idea of moving it. I used to, worked for a house mover back in Minnesota in the 70s, and it's way doable. I mean, they can move, we've moved three-story houses. So it's definitely a doable thing. I like that idea. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, seeing no one else in the audience, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, close the public hearing and uh, open up the discussion from commissioners. Any commissioners wish to comment? Uh, let's see, Commissioner Fenster. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that uh, the work that has been done to <clears throat> consider all the alternatives uh, is as yet complete. So I would recommend that we defer action, and uh, I think uh, ask our staff to make recommendations on what further work can be done either in terms of preservation or uh, preservation and moving the house uh, or any other alternatives. Uh, I think uh, passing finally uh, on this subject it would be premature at this time. Okay. Thank you. Any other commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Jacoby? <laughs> Forgive me for having a lot to say today. <laughs> um, I think some interesting points were made tonight. One is that all the foundations on the east side, at least, have, or a lot, all the houses have some problems. Many of them have structural problems. My time's not up. Um, <laughs> there is a house at 830 Emory um, that was demolished. It was an 18-something house. Um, it was demolished, what, about two, two or three years ago because they wanted it bigger and the foundation wasn't good enough. So that was the excuse for de demolition. Um, another house was proposed. It was a relatively incongruous 
housed for the neighborhood. The neighborhood uh, complained. Already the zoning says a house has to be compatible um, and the design was changed. Um, again, when we're considering the economics of this, I'm not sure that two modular homes are going to stand up to zoning to be compatible with our neighborhood. And I'm not sure, maybe, maybe Jennifer, you could comment, maybe it, could, it would work. But I can tell you that the neighbors would be in arms if those two modular homes, and there are pictures of them on page, I think, 26 and 27. If, if those went in, there would be quite a few complaints. Um, they might be cheaper, um, but they, they're not a reasonable alternative, and other alternatives would be more expensive and change the equation. So I just thought I'd throw that out there. Yes, I, I think there's some good points that have been made by Commissioner Fenster and Jacoby. My uh, biggest concern is that I like to study the, the, the basic, the main argument that the uh, proponent has made is the financial argument. And he might be right. But I, this morning, you know, I put a call into staff because I said, how am I supposed to make these decisions without any data? And, and I found out this afternoon that it was in about to be, you know, just had been sent to us. Uh, so I think Jennifer did the best she could in getting it, but I, I couldn't possibly get through this stuff uh, this afternoon. I mean, I was, as it, as it turns out, I was doing other stuff this afternoon. Even if I wanted to, I couldn't have read it. And it's the basis for our decision. So just on that basis alone. Now, I think the other issues really have to be up to the owner. It's not, I don't think it's our job to go out and do development work and to decide, well, this foundation or that foundation. But I think just alone, my reason for voting for it is simply because I haven't had a chance to review the basis for the decision that we're asked to make. Commissioner Norton. Commissioner Norton. Thank you. Um, so my understanding is we are not being asked to um, make a decision on whether demolishing this property is appropriate. It's whether we should designate against the owner's wishes. Is that correct? It's two well, sides. I know it's, they're related. It's two sides yes. of the same coin. So the question is if the property should be designated, rises to that occasion, rises to the threshold, then you would be asked. So basically, right. If if yes, then no demolition. If no, then the demolition could proceed potentially. So what? So based on the question of designation, I think that I have additional questions around how this. <coughs> excuse me. I promise it's allergies. Um, how this property contributes? I tested. Um, contributes to the east side district and I think I, I know that it, it officially doesn't but it does I think that probably goes into our, our later conversation around the survey plan um, and, and how we're going to be approaching some of these things um, based on that and based on the significance of the house I think that we need to really seriously consider that it does meet extraordinary circumstances as part of this district, whether it's official or not. Um, so I'd just kind of like to put that out there for our, our discussion as a Historic Preservation Commission. Um, but I would also like to say that, you know, I'm heartened by what I hear from the property owners in that it sounds like they came to you guys for a pre-approval conversation, that there's the opportunity for more discussion. So, you know, I agree with Commissioner um, Barnett that we don't have a ton of, didn't have a ton of time to review this today. Um, and it probably is not appropriate um, since the public didn't either. Um, that we've got other questions around the uh, historic district and how this house cont contributes to the historic district. As we gather additional information, you know, would it be appropriate for the current property owners to 
um, investigate some of these larger issues that we have brought up or these other options, um, maybe with, with staff help, because I do understand that historic preservation, when it's new, can be a little overwhelming. But I think there's potential paths forward. So can we gather all this information in different ways and defer this for later? I would say staff can definitely provide guidance based on what we're hearing from the commission. Um, you know, we do have constraints in terms of what we can do from a time and a appropriateness standpoint, sure. but we can definitely, you know, work with the applicant to put together essentially a, a, a plan to, you know, things that we can look at. Um, Moving forward, that's, I mean, what I'm hearing is from this commission is that you would like more information on the feasibility of moving the property, of moving the structure over um, as far as if, if the condition is of the actual building is such that it could be moved without being destroyed, what the financial cost of that would be. Um, options for ex expanding the moving the living space potentially um, you know yes 730 750 square feet it is small by modern standards it's not undoable at all I mean I think we've all lived I mean I, I lived in a 800 square foot two-bedroom house at one point so um, it is doable, but I know just from a marketing standpoint, it presents challenges. But at the same time, there is the market there. So sounds like there's some additional um, investigation that you would like to see. Um, yeah, I think we can get that wrapped up in a motion when we're all said okay. and done, just so okay. it's clear to you. Okay. And I've got a couple more Perfect. that want to speak, so Perfect. we'll just keep rolling along. If um, So uh, let's see, uh, Council Rep, uh, Mayor Peck. Thank you. Um, if the commissioners decide to defer this, I was, what, I would hope that staff would look into the possibility if this was uh, designated as a historic property, what would the tax credits be monetarily, and what, are they available? And also, would it help if this property were actually put into the historic district, as it is not now in the district? Would that help with the tax credits? And if it was historical, historically designated, are there any dollars to help with any of the decisions that the owners make as far as moving the property, um, some, of the, some of the benefits of being in, designated as a historical property? Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Jacoby. Yes, thank you again. Um, I'd, I'd like to uh, disagree, well, not disagree with Commissioner Barnard, but uh, he made a point that the economics is important, and it is very important. I mean, it's always the economy stupid, right? That's what Clinton said, and it's very important. But I think we need to also consider our role as commissioners, as uh, Sharon O'Leary mentioned, our role is to promote uh, preservation of homes. And so the economics is part of that. We have to consider that, but that's not all of that. And I think part of the economics also, when you, th there's intangibles with, uh, there's so many intangibles with historic preservation, his intangible benefits. But one economic benefit, I think uh, if you look at the, the price of homes per square foot in the east side, these little homes, people want smaller homes. People want to be in that neighborhood, yes, but I think they appreciate the character of the neighborhood too, and you may get more rent for a renovated home than you would for a modular home, which frankly is not built to last. If you're going to put renters in there, those things tend to fall apart and need more maintenance too. So that's all part of the, the equation, the economic equation, but I think we have to consider our role um, as commissioners. Um, how much is that how much are we here to promote preservation as well as the practical side of the bottom line? Thank you. Um, oh, yeah. How do I? Oh, oh, this, oh, oh yeah. So you do that? Okay. And that puts you in the queue? Okay. And then I'm sorry. Yeah. I thought, okay. All right. Uh, let's see. So, Commissioner Tarek. 
Um, okay. Um, I just would like to echo and agree a couple of things that Commissioner Jacoby said, and I think we are looking at two things. We're looking at the more subjective idea of preservation and more objective idea of the financial aspects. Um, and I think uh, some of the speakers we had, I, I do agree with you, it's very important that, you know, we can't just demolish a, st a structure because it's been neglected or because it's inconvenient or it's not large enough because part of these ideas are, you know, is why we want to preserve these structures. Um, and it is true, you know, you lose one house, you're losing part of that whole neighborhood and, and that district. And I think that is very important. And that is part of our roles here as commissioners is to protect that. Um, in regard to the financial and economic aspects, um, I do still have a lot of questions. And the idea of, you know, looking at the repair estimates, um, I'm, I would recommend that we defer any uh, voting now because I do have questions about how those repairs are going to be so much more expensive than putting two modular homes, building two more homes. Um, I mean, I recently bought a home here in Longmont. It's a small home. It had major foundation, foundation problems, electrical plumbing, la la la, um, and we were able to save it. Um, it was small. We put on an addition, and we were very careful that the addition matched the uh, the exterior. Um, and you know, people said, "Well, you're not going to find someone to do that for you know not a lot of money." And we did. You know, we just had to look around and find someone. Um, and so, I do have questions about how uh, how the cost plays out, the comparison between preserving and you know, building two new homes. Um, and so I would like uh, more information on that. And then in regard to the idea of also public interest in that, you know, you're creating more housing, well, you're replacing one, one small house with two small houses. So you're getting one extra house. I don't think that if you're weighing this, you know, that is really an argument for saying that you're providing a lot more housing um, in Longmont. I think that's a questionable argument as well. So, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Sibley. All right. Uh, thank you for saying that about the two houses because that was kind of oh. in my head as well. Um, I wanted to thank everybody for coming and I just wanted to say that it's, I'm glad that you folks came today and that things are kind of starting, you know, coming to us first is great. Um, and the reason I say that is look at how many ideas kind of came out of this particular meeting and hopefully, um, you know, with talking about tax credits and possibilities of moving and maybe adding to the house or something, I think looking at the neighbors and hearing what they're having to say, I think, okay, you know, maybe two houses isn't great because of parking. Never thought about mm -hmm. that with Grandpa's Pond. Um, you know, so there's maybe some other things to consider. So I just want to say thank you to you folks for coming, but also to these folks for coming and supporting their neighborhood. Um, and I think we've really come up with some interesting ideas just to start with. So hopefully that gives us, gives you guys a launch point for all of this. Thank you. Um, I've got just a couple of my own comments. Um, I did actually have a minute to run through that um, packet that was sent to us and it's going to end up in the public record. Um, and based on my quick math, you, you know, if you do take a look at foundation costs, you're, you're going to build a foundation regardless. You're going to build a foundation for a new home, two of them if you did this um so if, if we peeled out just you know a new foundation out of that and and a couple other little things you know landscaping you're probably going to pay anyways you know those repair estimates do get down to where i you know i think you really ought to take a closer look at this but i think you you could find that those repair estimates could be less than the cost of another home Maybe that would give you an opportunity to put an addition on the thing. Maybe it's a basement. But I do think there's a real opportunity here to for everyone to win, right? Because I don't know that this isn't about 
you know we want this preservation is important it's absolutely true there it, it, we lose um you know these houses one of a time but we do have a housing issue and we gain houses one of a time and so i would actually argue that there's a, there's a little more importance to you know you've got a you've got a lot that could be legally split you have a, you have a right to do that um, if there's a way that we can make that work and add a house into the pool and and get you what you are after um, that you can win but then the community can win because we preserve a home uh, and we preserve the fabric and and we can help you make that happen for the same dollars or maybe it's even less by the time we factor in some credits and so on um, you know that's a win for everyone and that's what I would like to encourage so uh, I think uh, it's you're getting the the message pretty strong here that that we're you know I think as a as a board on the whole uh, pretty supportive of trying to find a way to keep this house I, I think it would be preferable not to uh, engage in a process that that forces anyone down a path I'd rather see something that where we all work collectively and get get something done that that everybody's happy with um, so uh, with that in mind uh, it sure feels like we're gonna ask for um, a, uh, a motion to, to continue and ask for the applicant to, to do a, a real investigation into you know can can the house be moved my rough guess with my own experience is that that's a yes um, very often these homes are built very well above ground and somehow the foundations never got really paid a lot of attention to um, and if so if that can be you've got a cost in here already for the raise and lower the move from there my guess is not going to be that much if, if you can work out a scenario and really investigate the 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 possibility of of, of having that as your approach uh, and then work with staff to uh, to see what kind of other benefits economically there can be from the tax credit side um, and and come back uh, if you think you need to here um, with a different proposal if you, if you want to move it um, then we'd probably end up looking at that as well just as a you know give you the the, the approval but I can I can assure you there'd be a lot more support for something like that um, so again, I appreciate. I do appreciate you coming down here and starting this process, as other commissioners have mentioned. With that, uh, let's see. I'll t entertain a motion unless you have something else, uh, Commissioner Jacoby. I I would move that we defer decision on demolition. Okay. Uh, if you wouldn't, if That's you wouldn't weird. mind, yeah. Uh, I think we need a better, a little more clarify. Can you run through the, that specific option, please, Jennifer? Thank you. So it would be defer action on the request based on the need for additional information, which would be more detailed information about the um, about moving the property. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, Maria, were we able to get that, or do we need to? Okay. 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 Thank you. Uh, can I get a second? I will second. Okay. okay. So all motions tonight are made by Commissioner Jacoby and, and seconded <laughs> by Commissioner Norton, <laughs> which makes the recording very easy. I'm through. Uh, Maria, thanks you for that. Um, yeah. So there is a motion on the table to defer uh, with a request for additional information. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? None. So that motion carries unanimously. All right. Thank you for your time. Okay. Uh, with that, we will move on to uh, our new business item, which is a review of the draft historic survey plan. Okay. Yes. So we have a, as you mentioned, a draft of the historic survey plan. Uh, the consultant was not able to be here this evening. Um, we'll see if we can get him to the October meeting to discuss this a little further. Um, so basically, we're looking at content versus formatting for this plan. Um, they essentially identified areas of interest um, that need that we need to take a look at. Um, 
generally those areas are those that are adjacent to the original town. The sense was that we've got pretty good documentation of the original town plat um, with a few minor exceptions, but in terms of larger areas of focus um, would be uh, the Bond Farm neighborhood, um, what's known as Brown's Old Apple Farm, the Cannery East, Hilltop Village, Kitely, Longmont Estates, Lou Mil the, Mil bleh, the Lou Miller subdivisions, um, Old North, original town site, again, with some, some additional filling in, um, as well as the Southmore neighborhood. So strategies that have been recommended would be prioritize, prioritizing uh, the Bond Farm and Cannery East areas um, for surveys. They are um, experiencing probably the highest development pressures outside of the original town area for those adjacent, those kind of first ring suburb-ish, first ring neighborhoods outside of the original town. Um, and also look at the appropriateness of expanding current National Register Historic Districts that feeds into the discussion that we just had regarding um, the historic East Side District and the fact that it does not go all the way up to 9th Street or to 9th Avenue. Um, and also consider neighborhood guidelines and conservation overlay districts where appropriate. Um, those were really the big strategies. Um, you know, there are some, <laughs> let's see what else we have. So those are really, the. I really just wanted to give a high level overview and open it up to the commission for discussion. Um, if there are any areas that you want to see um, more, more discussion of, um, if you have any specific edits or any, any, any red lines or, or comments that you would like for me to share with, with uh, Josh and the heirs team. My first comment was, could we please have some maps? Yes. yes. <laughs> that was what I thought. <laughs> there, there will yeah. be maps in there. There will be maps. Okay. Uh, other comments or questions? Let's see. Uh, Commissioner Barner. Uh, first, I want to, uh, I wish he, he were here tonight because I'd like to congratulate him on uh, really hearing the things that we said at our meeting with him. Um, I really enjoyed reading the uh, uh, attached uh, information and, and, and looking forward to reading it uh, as it's filled out. But I think his outline is good and I think his approach is good. I think the way he lays out each one of the pieces. So uh, uh, it, it was very educational for me, uh, lear learning some of that stuff and uh, especially reading it uh, right next to Commissioner Jacoby's book. Um, the uh, <laughs> so I I just encourage him to keep doing, keep at it, and uh, uh, hopefully we'll uh, see some more drafts soon. Other comments or questions? No. No. Um, uh, I guess my so I, I I did really appreciate the the um, sort of action matrix at the end. Mm -hmm and the pr prioritization um and i understand that this will be part of the entire process but beyond that sort of matrix what i'd really like to be able to see is you know okay in order to act on these priorities i mean i, I think we need to discuss amongst the commission do we agree that these priorities are um are appropriate i, I since they're there, I wouldn't mind hearing from anybody if, if, if you have a, at least a, an exception to, to make. But um, to have an action plan for those, say, first two or three priorities, these are the things, these are the next steps that need to be taken in order to, you know, hit this particular action item. What do we need to do, right? Um, what's an appropriate timeline and what's uh, what's an expected financial need for that if any if that's a if that's something that's a request for council to put in their budget if it's something that needs a grant so on and so forth But 
yes, great start. Okay. Fun to see. Great to see progress and things happening. And but yes, maps. Please. So so aside from, aside from <laughs> graphics, which I know are in progress. Um, <laughs> So I guess in, in terms of, in terms of next steps and, and is you know, obviously it's the graphics, um, in terms of the action matrix, uh, order of priority based on commission input. If the commission has input on what you see as the high priority areas, that would be great for me to be able to provide. If that's something that you would like to email me after after the fact in the next week or so, that's great as well. If you want. Um, if, if if you'd like to you know do a do a markup and send it to me, I can always prepare provide that as well. Um, I can what I could do is put a document um, in. Do we we use a system called SharePoint where people can comment on the same document and therefore it's kind of a master document. We could always I could always set something like that up for the commission if that's something you're interested in. Um, what I'm also seeing is you, you'd like to see essentially, well, yeah, we do have the, as, as the items, commission priority, funding sources, estimated costs, these are things that we need to identify as well. So just figuring out which of these areas are your highest priority and, and you know, how where to start. Right, and with the National Register District potential expansion, you know, if that, what what's suggested, mm -hmm. right? What what. You know, it's a it's an idea, right? Uh, so, what what are the boundaries that would be suggested? Um, and and obviously with a explanation of why, right? So we can understand. Well, okay, well, I, you know, maybe that was a a miss, or it, and and I don't know how long. I mean, it's been a it's been long enough. Obviously, the the downtown register district is is relatively new, but you know. Why were the boundaries of the east side and west side made exactly where they were? <laughs> that might be a hard question to answer, but if we can answer it, uh, that would be potentially useful because it feels like a question that I might ask. I've definitely had the question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Especially as we're going through this exercise of looking at <coughs> properties within the historic east side. Right, right. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Jacoby. That was exactly my point. Um, when I read through that, I saw they discussed maybe extending the West Side Historic District into the uh, the uh, Browns Farm section. They didn't talk about the East Side, but again, if you if you read my book, you'll see that there's a lot of history and a lot of significant homes throughout the whole square mile on that side, and extending on that side might stop people from initially thinking that they can put modular homes in our neighborhood and think, wait a minute, what do I have to do? It may be a very good, I mean, there's a lot of, there's some carrots associated with it. I think the neighborhood might appreciate expansion of the historic district. And it might be feasible in that sense. It might be popular, but it might also preempt um, inappropriate uh, thoughts about development in the neighborhood. So I think they should look at the east side as well as the west side. Thank you. Any other commissioner comments on this? No? Oh, oh okay. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna give it, it looks like uh, Commissioner Barnard Beach. I, I think the same point. Uh, I think when the downtown historic district was designated, that's what there was. You know, and then north of Fifth Street, it was like, uh, uh, Cemetery. you know, cemeteries or, or farms or whatever. So I, when I look at that and I look at downtown Main Street, I say, well, why, why do we stop at Fifth Street? Why isn't, you know, uh, I don't have the answer to that. Uh, and um, so whether it, it's to know whether we should try to go further than that, it would be helpful if, it's, if my assertion is correct, that it was just that's where the town was at the time. That's where the development was. So there wasn't any, nobody, even thought, well, we're not going to designate some farm as a historic property. Um, but is that is it time to relook at that? I think just like um, Commissioner Jacoby was talking about the east side, I think the downtown area definitely needs to be looked at. So what are the advantages of expanding it to, to Long's Peak or to Ninth Avenue or whatever? Um, anyhow. So I can say the downtown district is, is our more, most recent district. It's really in the past, gosh, 
five years, maybe? It's been, it, it's been the past Just five years. Um, so it, 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 it is our most recent one. So um, yeah. I, I don't know what the, given, given how new it is, I don't know if it's appropriate to look at expanding the boundaries at this point, or maybe it is. Um, well, I guess the question is, why was it? Mm -hmm. Why was it established if it was in the last five years? I mean, we haven't, the downtown hasn't expanded that much in the last five years. So there was historic development further up. Why did we stop at, at Fifth Street? And if it's recent, then we might even be able to find the answer to that. Well, I suspect also the the answer is, and I, I would just need to contact Kimberly at LDDA, but I'm I'm fairly confident the answer has to do with concentration of the historic buildings um, in the the register district. Um, it gets a little f more thin as you go farther north, but that's that's a discussion I could have. It's a question okay. I could ask. Uh, Commissioner Norton. Yeah, um, I really appreciate it. You can tell that they really listened at the retreat and they took everything we said um, really seriously and it's reflected in this, so that's really nice. Um, both in the matrix and then in each of the recommendations for the individual neighborhoods, it talks about neighborhood guidelines or um, design guidelines and standards, uh, design review. What What is it gonna take to reach that because I think that that's really where we would start to see better guidance for folks who want to do things like subdivide a lot or um, you know pop a top and you know do something over on, on one of those uh, neighborhoods so um, what are those steps and mm -hmm. is it going to take full survey of each of these neighborhoods to get there um, is that something we haven't really discussed with these folks yet I really want design guidelines <laughs> <laughs> um, that would definitely be part of a, a completely separate uh, that would be part okay. of a different process we don't have the budget or the we don't have the yeah, budget for I this know one we don't it's, right def now. it's definitely a much heavier lift um, and you know we we are as Mayor Peck can tell you in budget season it's it's um, we're, we're definitely making some there's some hard decisions being made um, you know, as we're looking at projections, especially considering some of the property tax um, legislation, a special session information coming out of the state. So um, definitely what we, we do want to see is a time, not a timeline, but a, a map, you know, what's it going to take to get there. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of actually getting the work done, it's, you know, we're not there so that's really where we are where we need to do that prioritization and understand you know what it's going to take to develop these guidelines and then in what order we should be d developing them we would also need to um you know, figure out the public involvement public outreach because that yeah. would be very significant as well as you're looking at um, especially as you're do, looking at guidelines, if they take the form of conservation overlays, we do have. I mean, we do have some good language in our code in, in terms of um, residential compatibility standards. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's the discussion I, I need to have with our building folks to make sure that, like, how are we evaluating that? Because typically, planning staff doesn't look at single-family infill projects unless there is, you know, an ADU involved. Um, but, um, you know, that's a discussion we could have for sure. Okay. But I, I would see, I, you know, realistically what we're looking at is doing, you know, figuring out, you know, what the, what is the roadmap and what is the priority? Um, so, and just one more thing, I apologize. Um, as we do that roadmap, I think every other meeting we bring up the fact that there's uh, grant opportunities mm -hmm. and there's, there's, especially for the, the CLG or the SHF, there's a known calendar. Once we start identifying what neighborhoods need what kind of work, um, you know, maybe what we need to do is be thinking uh, ahead of time about that calendar and then how the Historic Preservation Commission can help staff because there's just one of you. <laughs> and I do and a we, lot we of other recognize things. that. <laughs> yes. Um, so like what what it would need for us to start um, 
tapping into some of these grant programs so that the onus isn't completely on the city of Longmont mm -hmm. to pay for these surveys. Thank you, Commissioner Norton. And uh, uh, Recording Secretary Yost, if you could underline and bold that comment <laughs> so that we can put it on flashers. Um, we can we can find funding for for some of this, uh, yes. you know, especially these smaller chunks. 100%. Mayor, Mayor Pet can attest to the fact that I do a lot of other things. <laughs> we don't doubt. <laughs> okay, great. Well, uh, I appreciate that. So uh, hopefully we'll have another more detailed uh, presentation on this at the next meeting with graphics and so on, mm -hmm. and that'll be very exciting. Okay, uh, Commissioner Barnett. Yeah. One um, uh, direct point to the commission and to staff on page 29 of the report, it's page 80 of the uh, packet, mm -hmm. talks about this. I think this is a very important paragraph, which is the whole idea of the, the original town site and that the areas within the boundaries were not reviewed by this study and that. Uh, I think this, this whole paragraph leaves open a lot of things that really we need to either decide what we'd like to see or get some recommendations as to how these can be uh, analyzed and presented to us. I mean, I, th I think there's a real ball of wax right in that one paragraph. I would love to know the answers, but they're not going to be in the study. So the question is, when would we see those answers? Because those affect, uh, otherwise this is you know, just paper without any recommendations because they don't have the ability to do certain analysis. Uh, are you referring to the analysis of the planning and zoning regulations and so well, on? Well, it just says no? original town site, and it, it points out all the things that this study, that this paper, this survey, is not going to have in it, and then it would say that it says this would help determine the applicability of the standards process when considering future design or preservation guidelines for neighborhoods, other neighborhoods. Well, that's exactly right. what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Well, yeah. in a big picture, I guess I would submit uh, just to that this document is about how we obtain more information about the properties within our city that haven't been surveyed to date. And that is the foundation that we need to have, speaking of foundations tonight, um, in order to then move to a step where we hopefully are able to engage a preservation plan as a bigger picture. And at that time, that preservation plan becomes a place where all of that information happens. It's where the public gets engaged to participate and we start putting together a bigger visionary document about preservation in Longmont. That's where I think that would land. I, I would agree with that. And that, that preservation plan, as I see it at least, would um, tie into Envision Longmont <laughs> and general comprehensive planning updates Absolutely. to ensure that we're all working together. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, prior business, I do not believe we have any. Is that true? Um, or do we have? Welcoming people? Commissioner Tarek. Yeah, yeah, that was prior. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that, why didn't somebody hit me over the head in chairman report for the chair? Because I totally intended to do that. And then I got lost in all the other stuff. So, yes. <laughs> Welcome, Commissioner Tarek. Thank you for uh, joining our fun little group, and uh, we look forward to your contributions. All right. Uh, any other further uh, comments from the HPC commissioners? Anybody else have a comment they'd like to make tonight? No? Uh, comment from our city council rep? No? All right. That will bring us to adjournment. Do I have a motion? <laughs> I'm first, right? <laughs> I make a motion to adjourn. I second. Thank you. Okay. Motion to adjourn by Commissioner Jacoby, seconded by Commissioner Norton. <laughs> all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, thank you. We are adjourned. Thank you all for your time this evening.